to the Andrea. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for being here today with us. This is the first basic notion seminar of 2021. Uh, well, today in this opportunity is a pleasure for me to present our speaker, Professor Emmanuel Car Carneiro from ICTP. And today he is going to talk about Fourier optimization and number theory. And please, if you have uh, any questions, you can write in the section of questions and answer at Zoom, and I will read for you. Or at the end, you can raise your hand, and we can allow you to, to talk. So thank you, Emmanuel, and I let you with him. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone, for stopping by this afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me fine? I suppose so. Let me share my screen with you. Hi. All right, welcome everyone. My big audience here in the Budenich Hall and my nice audience following from wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to me to be here. So this is the second time I have this privilege to give this basic notion seminar at ICTP, which is, in my mind, supposed to be a talk, you know, a little bit targeted to the students and to people who are learning mathematics, are in their PhDs. So this conversation this afternoon is going to be a little bit light, okay? Uh, let's see. It's a good opportunity to be recorded, so if you have seen parts of this talk, I apologize in advance. So the title is Fourier Optimization and Number Theory. And I wanted to convey to you some ideas without going too much into too much detail this afternoon on how to use tools, how to combine tools from analysis and number theory to you know, produce some, some nice results, some nice insights. Okay? Uh, you see here the pictures of the two main actors of this talk, Fourier on the left and Riemann on the right. Let's see. Let's have some fun. So this is my vision for the talk today, that I think that some mathematical lecture could be as interesting as going to the movies. You could have some fun. So let me know if at the end of this talk I at least partially fulfilled my, my promise to you. So it all starts with a trailer of what we're going to see. In the next minutes, what I promise to you are the following. We will see together a little bit of history. I will present to you some excellent business opportunities. We will understand how ballroom dancing can help in your mathematical career. We'll have some guest special lecturer, lecturer appearing. We will see how it's possible to make great compliments by accident. And most of all, I expect you to have some fun along the way. Uh, let's see. Part one of it's okay. So part one of the lecture today is called zeros and primes. So I want to refresh your memory about the Riemann hypothesis. So the last basic notion seminar that I gave here, maybe four years ago or three and a half years ago, was about the Riemann hypothesis. So I want to start today where I left off uh, in the other day. So the first is a com my favorite quote. One of my favorite quotes by mathematicians is this one by David Hilbert. He said, if I woke up from a 500-year sleep, the first thing that I would ask is whether the Riemann hypothesis had been solved. As you know, the Riemann hypothesis is, has appeared in this famous list of problems over the last century. Uh, more recently, it appeared in this list of seven millennium problems by, offered by the Clay Mathematics Institute. So it's worth a million dollars if you can solve it. So here's a nice business opportunity that I promised to you. If you want to get a million dollars, it's one way to do it. Here's our, one of our main actors, Riemann. So he had a short life. He lived 39 years old. He was 39 years old when he died. He was a professor at Göttingen. Uh, 
He had several marvelous contributions to mathematics, notably the Riemann integral, the Riemannian geometry, and many, 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 many contributions. And in number theory, he wrote just one paper, but it, it turned out to be a very influential paper. So it was an eight-page paper uh, published in November of 1859, in which he discusses the, some properties of this, what became known as the Riemann zeta function. So this function that's there in your screen, it's called zeta of s, is just the sum of the inverse powers. You know, it's 1 plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s plus 1 over 4 to the s. So you start with s being a complex variable with real part bigger than 1 to make this sum well-defined and absolutely convergent. You know, by using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, you can just factor, right? So the sum over all the integers factors as the powers of 2 plus the times the powers of 3, times the powers of 5, and so on. And each of these sums over prime powers is a geometric progression now, so you can actually evaluate what's the sum. And you get here what's called the product formula for the Riemann zeta function on the right of 1. Okay? So from this product formula, you already see that this function has no zeros there. Before Riemann, Euler had already worked with uh, similar sums, but mainly taking the variable s to be real and not complex. Uh, well, in this paper, Riemann presented some of the most important properties of the Riemann zeta function. So, for example, he showed that this function, which, in which you start to the right of 1, you could somehow manipulate it and bring it to be well-defined to the right of 0 having a pole at s equals to 1. Then he went ahead and he showed that this function, you know, in this strip between 0 and 1, satisfied a very nice functional equation. If you define this function c of s to be just zeta of s multiplying by some well-known factors, say s, s minus 1, pi to the minus s over 2 and times gamma of s over 2. Gamma is the gamma function here. So written in this form, this Riemann c function, satisfies a very neat functional equation, namely, C of 1 minus S is just C of S. So you have a reflection here. Uh, and you can use this functional equation, since you have a function which is just defined to the right of 0 now, you can use this functional equation to define the function in the whole complex plane by analytic continuation. Okay, so now here's the catch. From the product formula, the Riemann zeta function has no zeros to the right of 1. From the functional equation, the Riemann zeta function will have the trivial zeros at the negative even integers. So these have to come to kill the poles introduced by the gamma function. All the other zeros of the Riemann zeta function must have real part between 0 and 1. And here's where it lies the question. Okay? Riemann already know, he already knew how to compute the amount of zeros. So this function actually has a lot of zeros, and we already knew that if you go up to a certain height t, and the height here is just along the imaginary axis, so from 0 to t, you have roughly t log t over 2 pi zeros. So that's a lot of zeros. And the Riemann hypothesis that he proposed in this paper is that all of these zeros are aligned, are aligned in this uh, so-called critical line, the line all the non-trivial zeros have real part equals to one half. So here is the, if you have never seen this before, this is a nice image. This is uh, the, the manuscript, the original manuscript of Riemann. So if you're curious to see how was the handwriting of Riemann, here it is. There you can see the Riemann zeta function and the product formula written here. So here's the version he submitted to the journal. Here is the part in the manuscript where he proposes the Riemann hypothesis, and you see it's relatively innocently you know, written in the sense that he says, and here's a rough translation to English from the German manuscript. One now finds indeed approximately this number of roots within these limits. So he's referring to the counting of the, the zeros. And it's very probable that all the roots are real. So here he's working with the rotation of the axis. So what he means to say is that all the roots are probably aligned. Certainly, one would wish for a stricter proof here. 
I have meanwhile temporarily put aside the search for this after some fleeting futile attempts as it appears unnecessary for the next objective of my investigation. So here he just mentions that all of these routes probably are all aligned, but he, didn't, he does not prove. And neither do we 161 years later. Here's the published version of the manuscript that appeared in the monthly notices of the Berliner Academy of Sciences in November of 1859. Okay. So here's one of my favorite papers in the theory of the Riemanns at the function. So lots of progress has been made. You know, We already know that uh, computationally, the first 10, you know, trillion of zeros are in the critical line where they should be. But this paper is, is an example of a paper that proves that 40% of the line, or of the zeros are on the critical line. So it's a paper by Brian Conry. Uh, more than two-fifths of the zero lie in the critical line. So he's able to prove that 40% are where they should be. Of course, this is an asymptotic result. So if, if you go high enough, at least 40% of the zeros are where they should be. So this was just to introduce me, to, to mention to you a funny story that happened to me as I promised you in the beginning of the talk, how ballroom dancing affected my life. I don't know if I told this to many people, but I was a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in 2009. They were having a thematic year in analytic number theory, especially in the celebration of the 150 years of the Riemann hypothesis. So all, there were many people there, about 100 people spending the whole year, you know, lots of the Greatest mathematicians of our time that worked in number theory were there. Of course, I was just a young guy. Never had uh, too much the chance or never had too much to talk about to any of these big guys. Until one day in the fall, and I was able to find this in the internet to prove you that I was not, you know, telling you lies. I found this news newsletter that they had. Every trimester they had a newsletter there, every three months. So this was the one from the year that I was there, where they invite people. They had lots of activities for, for the families at the institute. So this particular one was inviting people to ballroom dancing lessons. They had an, an end of the year uh, ball, an end of the year gala there. And people, if they, they wanted to do this, the ballroom dancing, they could go. At the time, of course, I mean, my wife got this and got very excited. We should go, we should go. And I was kind of, uh, I'm not so sure, I'm not so good at this. I was kind of trying to give her some excuses. Uh, and then after one week, I could give some excuse. After the second week, I could give some other excuse. After the third week, I could give some other excuse. Until in the fourth week, I guess, uh, I, was, I ran out of excuses. And this is when I went there. And uh, there was, among the, all the people in the ballroom dancing, there was just one other mathematician there, which is the author of that paper, you know. And I had, I mean, he knew me from the corridors. We never had the chance to talk. I was just a young postdoc. But in the ballroom dancing lessons, he looked at me and said, well, are, you're a mathematician, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. I know who you are. I said, yeah. And he looked at me and he just said, well, it seems that you could not give a proper excuse to your, to your wife here today either, right? And I said, yes, no. So we are here. So at this day, we ended up uh, playing cards later and discussing little bits about mathematics. So the moral here is ballroom dancing makes friends. This happens for me. And some of the nice pictures that you see in the stock are provided by, by, by this, this good friend, Brian Conry from the American Institute of Mathematics. All right, so second part of the talk today is to discuss a little bit about oscillations. And when you talk about oscillations, uh, you want to talk about Fourier. Okay? So Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier was a French mathematician. He's, he has his name on the, on the Eiffel Tower. So a picture, this is a picture I took the first time I went to Paris. I was illuminated how the French, you know, pay some nice tribute to their scientists, put 18 names on each side of the Eiffel Tower. So there are 72 names of scientists there. Just by curiosity, there are 21 names of mathematicians in the Eiffel Tower, and Fourier is one of these. 
So the whole idea of, of Fourier was to decompose complicated functions into you know, smaller, into you know, simpler pieces. Sometimes, today we know this as Fourier series, which is just an expansion of, uh, say, a periodic function into its basic components, sine and cosine, sine of x, sine of 2x, sine of 3x, sine of 4x, and, and cosine. Okay? So here's an example. And this is, on, the, on a very basic level, this is actually the, what's behind all sorts of telecommunications that we have nowadays. Whenever you want to transmit a signal, what, what is done is that you have a certain signal, you express this as a Fourier series, you take the first 30 or 40 or 50 coefficients, which is what our ear or our eye, what we can see or what we can hear, and then you just send this, this sample, you know, 50 signs. Instead of sending an infinite number, you just send 50 or 40 to the other side. The person that receives in the other side gets this 40 and reconstructs the, the rest essentially randomly because we don't care, and this is how a signal is transmitted, you know. Here's an example how to write a function as a superposition of sines and cosines. You see, the more you go, I mean, the, 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 the best precision you have. Now, so the, the, the theory of Fourier series is developed on the periodic world. You have a periodic function, you can have the, you have the Fourier series. If you are working in the Euclidean space, and for now let's just work in the real line, R, what you have is the Fourier transform. Okay, so start with the function f, and let me just mention the definition here. We start with the function f, L1, it means an integrable function in R, and whenever you have this, you can define an object that we call the Fourier transform, f hat, and f hat of t is given by this integral. So it's the integral over the whole real line of your function f of x multiplied by e to the minus 2 pi i t x. For those of you who have never seen this, e to the pi, e to the i theta is just cosine theta plus i sine theta. Okay? So this is one of the most famous objects in harmonic analysis. And harmonic analysis is essentially the subject that proposes to understand the nature of oscillatory phenomena. Okay, so this is an example of an oscillatory operator where you have this kernel e to the minus 2 pi i x, 2 pi i t x, that highly oscillates. So you expect that in this integral, you have lots and lots of cancellation. So when your parameter t is very big, you have more and more oscillation, then the Fourier transform should be small. Okay? But anyway, this is a well-defined operator. You define it in L1. If the Fourier transform is suffic has sufficient decay, you can invert this operator, so you can just recover your function f of, f, f of x by taking the inverse Fourier transform of f hat. And we have a nice theorem of Plancharel that says, okay, if you start with a function that is in L1 intersection L2, then in fact, let's say, start with a Schwartz function, the Fourier transform preserves the L2 norm. So the L2 norm of f is the L2 norm of f hat. So this means that you can, if you start in a dense subspace, say Schwartz functions, you can extend this transform to the whole L2. So this is really the right environment where the Fourier transform lives. It's an isometry in L2. Now, throughout this talk, I will talk a lot about band-limited functions. So in the whole language of telecommunications, a band-limited function is nothing else than a function f such that f hat has compact support. Compact support is something which is particularly interesting for the transmission of signals. You know? These are the, some, somehow the simplest functions, the functions whose Fourier transform has compact support. Okay, I told you that we were going to have some guest lecturers today here. And here he comes. I wanted to make a point, especially to the students who are watching this video. This is a little bit of what I try to say to the students, that when you're learning at this level, at the, your undergrad, at your master's, at your PhD, you're going to take a bunch of courses, and you should pay really attention to try to learn them very well. 
because you know, the most fruitful ideas in mathematics today occur when you actually combine tools from different fields. Okay? So when you have the chance, for example, to learn in analysis, you will do a bunch of courses with an analytic flavor. You will do in your life real analysis, complex analysis, harmonic analysis, analytic number theory, functional analysis, geometric measure theory, PDEs, and so on and so forth. So all of these courses are important, and you should really pay attention to, to the main results and get what is behind the philosophy in each of these. You never know when you're going to, be, to, to need to use these results. You should focus on the fundamentals of learning all of these things well. Okay? And my analogy here, as I, I remember I told you in this very same auditorium, and Massimo was, was recording this as well, and he liked very much, uh, was with the analogy of Mr. Miyagi in teaching Daniel Sam Karate, right? So I don't know if you have seen this movie. You're probably younger than me watching this lecture. But this was a nice movie in the 80s when I was a kid. So I remember very vividly watching this movie where the young boy, Daniel San, is being bullied at school by some other uh, people there. And uh, he somehow gets to know Mr. Miyagi and uh, who seems to know karate, and Daniel Sam asks Mr. Miyagi to teach him. Can you teach me karate so I can defend myself at school? And Mr. Miyagi says, sure, I will teach you karate. And then he takes Daniel Sam to his house and starts to give him house chores. So he asks Daniel Sam to paint the, his fence, to wax his car, to sand the floor. And Daniel Sam spends two, three weeks doing just that. And then after three weeks, he gets pissed off because he didn't learn anything of karate that he was supposed to. And he confronts Mr. Miyagi and says, what the hell, man? You promised to teach me karate. I'm just doing your house chores here. And this is how Mr. Miyagi teaches analysis. Let me show the video to you. Show me wax on, wax off. Yes! 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 Show me pen to fence. Hey! Hey! Yes! Yes! Show me side to side. Yes! 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 Show me sand of floor. Hey! 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 Very nice. OK, so now's the time to practice. You have a solid foundation. You have learned many things in all of these many courses. Let me show you just a little bit of how we can combine some tools from some of these courses to produce some nice results. And this is what I call arriving at Fourier optimization wonderland. So this was the topic of the talk today, how to use some optimization problems that arise in Fourier analysis, so these are going to be purely analytical problems, to draw some conclusions to some problems in number theory. Okay? So first, let me give you some motivation to what I'm going to do. I mean, this slide might look a little bit dense, but you don't have to really pay too much attention to it. Uh, just the philosophy of it is the following. I'm going to apply here the, the residue theorem in complex analysis, OK? So you start with the function xi. This is Riemann's xi function. This is just zeta multiplied by some factors. And in blue there on, the, on, on your corner, the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the symmetries that this function xi satisfies. So you have the functional equation, xi of 1 minus s is xi of s. And you have also this xi is a, is, is, a, is a real entire function in the sense that it's real in the real axis. So xi of s bar bar is equal to xi of s. Now, and remember, this function xi has the same non-trivial zeros of zeta. So there are two things you can do with that. You can take the logarithm derivative of this function. You can take the log derivative, xi prime over xi. You just expand. And you have a zeta prime over zeta appearing here 
which is something that has a well-known Dirichlet expansion. So zeta prime over zeta is, you can write it as a Dirichlet series. So it's going to be the sum of this function lambda of n over n to the s. And this lambda of n is a certain function that encodes the information about the primes. So it's just lambda n is log of p if n is a prime power and zero otherwise. Okay? So you get this expansion for zeta prime over zeta directly from the product form. If you just take the product form of zeta and take the log derivative there, you get, you arrive to this. Now, I told you I wanted to do some sort of uh, residue theorem here in complex analysis. So I start with the function h. Let h be a good function. And by good here, I mean a function that has the right decay properties because I'm going to send some of these lines to infinity. But if you start with a good function h, let's see. I want to sum h over the row are going to be the zeros here of zeta. So I'm going to sum h over the ordinates of the zeros of zeta. Roughly speaking, I want to sum h of rho minus a half over i. And I can write this as just this integral, this contour integral of this contour c here, which is uh, highlighted on the right of the function h of the complex variable s minus a half over i times the log, log derivative of xi. Okay, this xi prime over xi there just picks up as poles the zeros of xi. So by a, an application of the residue theorem, you get that this integral over this contour is just the sum of, of h over these zeros. Now, this is one way of evaluating the integral. Another way, of course, is to expand what's in the right-hand side. And to expand what's on the right-hand side, you have to understand the symmetries. So this C has a, lot, has a lot of symmetries. So if you start with a contour, which has two greens and two reds, as I mentioned there, you can just use this symmetry between S and 1 minus S to relate the two greens. And you can use this symmetry between S and S bar to relate the reds. So you can transform this integral that goes over a rectangle to essentially an integral just to on one side of the rectangle, half of it. And we do what we do in complex analysis usually. Once you have reduced that, you send uh, the parameter big T here, which is the height to infinity. And then you have just a green light, a green line to the right. You're going to shift this green light to a little bit towards the critical line. So if you do these computations properly and patiently, what you get is what we call an explicit formula. So remember, on the left here, you have the expression that was there on the left-hand side before, the sum over a function h over the zeros. And on the right, what you get is what you get when you do this process. So you have some terms here uh, from h evaluated at two points that come from the poles, some uh, integral of the log derivative of the gamma function, and some expression, this comes from the, the, the zeta prime over zeta because it has the big lambda factors here times the Fourier transform of H. You don't have to memorize what this formula is. I don't expect you to. I just want to highlight uh, the good features of this formula. It contains the zeros of zeta on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it contains the primes. These are encoded by this lambda function. And it has the Fourier transform of H. So these are three things that we like, zeros of zeta, prime numbers, and the Fourier transform. Of course, if you are working under the Riemann hypothesis, if you assume that the Riemann hypothesis is true, then the zeros have the form 1 half plus i gamma, and your formula simplifies because then this rho minus a half over i becomes just h of gamma. So I'm just really summing, summing a function h over some certain real numbers gamma. Okay? So this is the bottom of the story. So if you have a good function h and you want to evaluate at the ordinates of the zeros of zeta, I want to sum h of gamma for a good function h. There is a way to do this by means of these explicit formulas. Now, for this to work, I mean, for this to be meaningful, for you to have a chance to estimate in this thing, your function h that you plug in there must be a good function, right? For example, what is good for, for me here in this case? This term that is in orange there, that has the Fourier transforms, if I have a function h that is band limit, such that the Fourier transform has compact support, this would be good because this infinite sum that appears there would just be finite. Okay? So in most of my applications, 
I want, I want to just plug in a function h, which is band limited. For some other applications, you want to put a function h, which is, has, is negative outside some part of the support. Anyway, let me move on. So let me mention now, I want to mention to you four problems in the interface of number theory and harmonic analysis. The first problem is to estimate the size of z, the size and the argument. So, so here's the zero counting formula of Riemann, the number of zeros up to height t. It's just t log t over 2 pi minus t over 2 pi plus a constant plus this function s of t that appears here. So this, this, is, this function s of t is just the argument. It's 1 over pi times the argument of zeta at the point 1 half plus i t. Okay? There are two basic, if you have a complex number or if you have a complex valued function, there are two basic quantities that you want to understand. First is the modulus of the complex number and the second one is the argument. Here's what I'm going to do now. Okay, so this, this argument function, uh, here's how you define, of course, the argument of a complex number is, is well defined, but modulo 2 pi. So what you do is, if you want to define the argument at the, at the point 1 half plus it, you have to start, here's the little graph in green in your screen. You start at the point 2, you know what z of 2 is, it's just uh, a real number. So you baptize the argument there to be 0. So you define the argument at z of 2 to be 0. And then you go along a line vertically up and then horizontally to the left. And you let your argument vary continuously along this line until you arrive at the point uh, 1 half plus it. If you did not hit a 0, your argument varied continuously. You baptize the argument at that point as being what you get. Uh, if by some chance this line contains a 0, you cannot pass through a zero, so what you do is you take the half of the limit coming from upside and from below. Anyway, unconditionally, that means without assuming the Riemann hypothesis, one can show that this uh, argument function is big O of log of t. It means that if t is very large, this loses to a certain universal constant times log t, so the argument doesn't grow too fast. In fact, there's an old paper of Littlewood in 1924, so this is, this is almost 100 years old, that shows that both the size of zeta and the argument are not too big in the critical line, meaning that log of the absolute value of zeta of a half plus it loses to this big O of log t over log log t, and also the argument on the Riemann hypothesis, you can do a little bit better than just log t. You can prove that it's big O of log t over log log t. Okay? So these are the best estimates, best up-to-date estimates for the, for, for, for the size of zeta and for the argument, for the modulus of zeta and for the argument of zeta in the critical line. Best in the sense that nobody in almost 100 years was able to improve the order of magnitude of these estimates. All the improvements have occurred in the implicit constant, implicit universal constant that you can put in front of these estimates. So let me mention to you a couple of these results. So this is a result of, of Shandy and Sander Arajan in 2011. They proved that under RH, for the size of zeta, for log of zeta of a half plus it modulus, this is less than or equal than this particular constant, log 2 over 2 times the main term, log t over log log t. This improved upon a previous result of Sander Arjan from 2009, which was published in the Annals, by the way. Uh, and the idea was to, the idea that you will see uh, passes through those explicit formulas that we discussed a little bit ago. The idea is to express the quantity that you're interested in, the log of modulus of zeta of a half plus it, you want to find an expression for the object that you, you have at your hand as just being a, a well-known function plus a sum over zeros plus an error term. And this is exactly what's done there. So the object that I want, which is the log of the absolute value of zeta, is a well-known function, log t, minus the sum over the zeros, gamma, 
gamma are the ordinates of the zero, so the sum for a, of a function f, t minus gamma, plus an error term, big O of 1. And the function f that appears naturally connected to this problem is this function here, log of 4 plus x squared over x squared. So you find, yourself with this, you find yourself with this problem. You want to estimate an object. This boils down to estimate a sum over zeros of a certain function f. But this function f is not good enough. It's not good enough in the sense that we discussed before. I didn't actually uh, say to you what good enough meant before. But certainly, this function is not good enough because it's not even a continuous function. Okay? So in the previous slide, I needed a function which was actually uh, analytic in a strip containing the real line. Certainly, this is not the case. But what's the strategy there? The strategy, as we'll see, is if you want to generate an inequality, so what's written here is an identity, log of modulus of zeta, where am I? Log of modulus of zeta is equal to a certain sum plus a sum over zeros plus O of 1. So this is an identity. If you want to generate an inequality, you could replace your function f that appears there by some function that is below it. Okay? Therefore, you would generate an inequality. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to replace it by a function that lies below it, and possibly with a good function, and then we'll try to estimate the sum. The same philosophy was applied to a theorem we proved later. So this is a theorem of myself with Chandi and Milinovic two years later, where we studied the analogous problem, not for the modulus of zeta, but for the argument of zeta in the critical line. Here, the strategy is the same. To write your object, here's the function s of t, as a sum over the zeros of a certain function f plus an error term. And the function f that appears naturally connected to this problem is this function, r tangent of 1 over x minus x over 1 plus x squared. This is an odd function that has a jump discontinuity at the origin, so it's not good for our purposes to apply the explicit formula. And we will adopt the same strategy. So if we want to generate an inequality, we can replace this function f by another function that lies above or that lies below, and then I will be able to generate an inequality. And hopefully, this function that you place above or below is a good function in the sense that you can plug in the explicit formula and evaluate. So this is what's drawn in this picture. You have your function there in black, in the, in, the, in the bold black. That's the original function. And you see a little function that is above it, that is majorizing this function. Okay. And I told you, it would be great if this function that we choose to majorize was a band-limited function, was a function with the Fourier transform with compact support. So we can just plug in, in the explicit formula. And it, one of the sums that appear there would become relatively easy to tackle. This is a picture of Feisch and D. Michael Milinovic, with whom we did this work a few years ago. And this is the analysis problem. This is the Fourier analysis problem that is connected to that number theory problem. So you will see, that's a purely analytical problem. I give you a function f from r to r. And I want you to find functions l and m such that L is smaller than F everywhere, and M is greater than or equal to F everywhere. So L minorizes F, and M majorizes F. The support of the Fourier transforms of L and M is contained in an interval, let's say from minus 1 to 1. Given these constraints, I want you to minimize the distance from F to L and from M to F. Minimize the distance in which norm, then you have to pick a norm. For me here, the most convenient norm will be the L1 norm. You really want to minimize the integral from M to F, M minus F, or the integral from F minus L. It turns out that this problem, which is purely in analysis, and you can present this problem without, without ever talking about analytic number theory before. This, was actually, this is actually a very old problem in, in approximation theory. Okay. This was considered by, by Berling in the late 30s and then revisited by Zellberg in the 50s. So here's a construction of a majorant for the characteristic function of the interval. So lots of nice applications in analytic number theory come just from replacing the characteristic function of an interval by a band-limited majorant. So this was one of the insights of Zellberg and, and Berling in the past. 
Um, well, this problem is generally hard, meaning that there is no obvious recipe to generate the solution. Uh, this is a theorem that we proved a while ago, some 10 years ago. Uh, joint work with uh, Friedrich Littmann and Jeff Waller, which is essentially says we, we have the most you know, general framework for the solutions of this so-called Berlin-Zellberg extremal problem. And it goes as follows. I mean, this, this, this general framework that we have establishes the solution of this problem whenever your function f is subordinated to a Gaussian, whenever there is a Gaussian subordination going on. Gaussian subordination in which sense? Well, we have the solution for this problem if your function f is given by the integral of a Gaussian, e to the minus lambda pi x squared. Lambda here is a parameter. And you can integrate this Gaussian against any measure, d mu of lambda. So essentially integrating a Gaussian with any measure. Okay, So if f is of this form, or this is the even function, and or if f is, is, an, is an odd version of this function, essentially it's the integral of a Gaussian against the signum of x. So this is the odd version. If there are some mild conditions on this measure, we can generate the solution of this problem. For example, if the measure is, is, is a non-negative Borel measure, finite, we get the solution of this problem. And by, by the solution, I mean this problem has a unique solution, and we can say what it is, and we can compute the value of the minimal integrals. Okay. Now, it's not obvious that the functions that appeared in connection to the, those two applications in number theory, for example, this function f of x arc tangent of 1 over x minus 1 of x over 1 plus x squared, which is a odd function, it's not obvious that this function is the integral of a Gaussian against a certain non-negative finite measure. And here's what it is. It actually is. So this crazy function, arc tangent, blah, 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 is just the integral of a Gaussian against the measure which is highlighted in orange there, which is, you can, you can prove that it's a non-negative and finite Borel measure. Therefore, this function falls into the framework that we had for this analysis problem. We can generate this optimal uh, majorance and minorance with the compactly supported Fourier transform. You go back to your problem, you plug in these, and you use the explicit formula and a careful asymptotic analysis to actually compute what the main term is. This is the general strategy. Of course, the proof is full of technicalities. That is not the point for me to present here. But I just wanted to highlight to you what's the main you know, strategy going on behind that. Moving on. This is a, this is a picture of uh, Friedrich Littmann and Jeff Waller, who appeared in this work. Uh, a nice feature that appeared in this, in this previous connections between the you know, problems in bounding the, the zeta and with these band-limited functions is this one of my favorite theorems in harmonic analysis, it's called, which is called the paley wiener theorem. So this is a bridge between harmonic analysis and complex analysis. This is, this is to say that it says the following. Every time you have a band-limited function, so functions in L2, the following two things are equivalent. The function is band-limited, meaning that the support of the Fourier transform is contained in an interval minus delta delta. And f can be seen, can be extended to an entire function of order 1, which has what we call exponential type, 2 pi. So it's an entire function of order 1 that verifies this growth, f of z, in modulus loses to a constant, essentially times e to the 2 pi delta modulus of z. Okay? So you see, entire functions of order 1 and exponential type are essentially you know, Fourier transforms of functions whose Fourier transform has compact support. This is a theorem of Paley and Wiener. Uh, Wiener, and you see, if you see in this picture, lived a lot. Raymond Paley lived only 26 years old. You are a harmonic analyst. You probably have used many of the results from Paley in your research. You know, Paley appears in Littlewood Paley theory, appears in this Paley multipliers, you know, Paley Wiener theorem, and so on. And it's incredible that he did this everything before being 26. As a matter of fact, he died in a ski accident. And he's, so he was skiing in the Rocky Mountains in Canada and near the Banff station. And uh, nowadays, there is a conference center in Banff, Canada. So 
Whenever, when I went there for the first time, I went to a conference. This is a picture of me and my advisor, Jeff Waller. I told him, hey, we are, we are huge fans of this theorem. So I told him in the conference hall, hey, do you know that Paley is just buried 10 minutes from here? And he said, no kidding. I said, yeah. So we took a walk from the conference center, 10 minutes to the cemetery to take a picture in the, in the tomb of Paley, you see there. So of course, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, every time I look at this picture, I put here in black and white, I remember of another picture of also another one of my favorite movies from my childhood, which is Back to the Future. So here's another great advisor. So my advisor was a great advisor to me. He's, here's an example of another great advisor and a somewhat rebel student in, with an object that is meaningful to both of them. Third application. Now we talk a little bit about prime gaps. And uh, this is a very, you know, simple problem, simple to state, in the sense that we let Pn be the nth prime number. So you just take the sequence of prime numbers and you take Pn to be the nth prime number. And an old result of Cramer, 100 years old, 1921 exactly, says that under the Riemann hypothesis, the gap between two consecutive primes is not so big, meaning he proved that Pn plus 1 minus Pn is big O of square root Pn log Pn. So meaning there is a universal constant that you can put there that bounds the Pn plus 1 minus Pn in terms of this quantity. Again, this is an estimate that was not, has not been improved in almost 100 years, the order of magnitude of this one. It is actually believed to be much smaller than this but nobody has been able to prove. All the improvements have concentrated in improving the explicit constant that you can put in front of it. So a theorem of ours from a few years ago, this is with Milinovic and Sandor Arajan, we proved that under the Riemann hypothesis, the gaps, the gaps between consecutive primes, so Pn plus 1 minus Pn, loses to this number, 22 over 25, square root of Pn log Pn. And this is the best up to date for all the prime numbers bigger than 3. So this, this improved upon a previous result of Dudek, Grenier, and Molteni, who had essentially 1 in place of 22 over 25. And so, so the difficult part was to beat 1. For a little bit, uh, some new ideas were necessary to beat the, the threshold of 1. And these new ideas came in this paper by, by relating this problem of measuring the prime gaps to another problem purely in Fourier analysis. So here in orange, is a problem which you can just assign to a person purely working in analysis, which is the following. Given Fourier optimization problem, so given a number a bigger or equal than 1, you fix an a bigger or equal than 1, I want you to find a function f, real valued, even, continuous, and integrable, say, that maximizes the certain, this certain object. So in the bottom, you divide by the L1 norm of f, so you normalize by the integral of f, and you want to maximize f of 0 minus a times, so this is the penalty thing, so minus a times the integral of f hat plus, this is the positive part of f hat outside the interval minus 1, 1. So for any function, you can play this game, plot, in, plot this function in this functional, and tell you what it gives. So you take f of 0, and you subtract a times the integral outside minus 1, 1 of the positive part of the Fourier transform. I want you to find the function that maximizes this object. This is a hard problem. The berlin zellberg problem was hard, but we could actually find the explicit solution. This is also a hard problem, but we are far away to finding it. I don't think it's actually possible to actually find the exact solution given a certain number a. This is, this is difficult. Uh, what we can do in this paper is find good upper and lower bounds. For this application to prime gaps, the, this problem comes, the, this problem arises with a certain particular number A associated to it. So you can take A, for example, to be 4, okay? And then you can just uh, investigate. And every time you find a good function for this problem, you can generate a good estimate for your number theory problem, too. So this is 
what I meant by arriving in Fourier optimization wonderland. So you arrive at the Fourier analysis problem that is complete. Every time you can do a better bound for this problem, there is a better bound in the number theory problem that you are also allowed to, to make. Okay, here's a picture of, of Sandra Arajan and, and, and Chiri. Chiri will appear in the next slides. I am getting close to the end of my conversation with you here today. So the last application that I want to mention is to this problem of uh, pair correlation of zeros of zeta. And this is a very nice topic too. So Riemann already knew how to compute the number of zeros up to height t. So Riemann knew that the number of zeros up to height t was t log t over 2 pi. And uh, the goal in this theory of pair correlation is to study how the zeros are distributed. You know, if they are evenly distributed in the certain scale or not, right? So his, the goal was to study this function. Now I give you a parameter beta, and I want to compute this function n of t beta as just being the sums over pairs of zeros, gamma and gamma prime, up to height t, and whose distance between gamma prime and gamma loses to 2 pi beta over log t. So whose distance loses to beta times the average spacing. Okay, so the question is, if you know that there are this number of zeros up to height t, are they equally spaced given the scale or not? Or do they behave somehow differently? And it seems that they, they, they don't behave equidistributed in this scale. There is some skewed uh, movement towards the side. And it goes, this is the content of the conjecture made by Hugh Montgomery in 1972, that this number n of t beta is essentially the number of zeros up to height t times the integral of this kernel, integral from zero to beta, one minus the fair kernel, one minus sine pi x over pi x squared. Okay? So you should note that if the zeros were equally distributed in this scale, this kernel should not be there. The n of t beta should just be n of t times beta. The fact that the conjecture has a one minus something proves that the zeros behave a little bit different than the, what is the equidistribution here. Uh, this is a conjecture for almost 50 years now called Montgomery's pair correlation conjecture. Uh, here's a picture of Hugh Montgomery, perhaps one of the men alive who better understands this connection between harmonic analysis and number theory. So he has a very, one of my favorite books. It's called 10 Lectures in the Interface Between Harmonic Analysis and analytic number theory and harmonic analysis. Uh, as a matter of fact, this whole, this conjecture generated a bunch of, you know, new research directions, new connections between different uh, fields in mathematics and physics arose because of this. You know, he was a young postdoc. This is in the year of 1972. Montgomery was a young postdoc. He was visiting the Institute for Advanced Study. And uh, he was kind of showing to the number theorists there, Zellberg and Chawla, what he had found, what was his uh, conjecture and so on. And they found it very interesting. And they told him, well, you should talk to Freeman Dyson, the famous physicist at the Institute for Advanced Study there at the time. He talked to Dyson and he told him, well, I believe that the pair correlation of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function is given by this, this measure. And then Dyson said, well, this is the same pair correlation function that appears in the eigenvalues of a random matrix. And so this connection between the Riemanns at the function and the theory of random matrices was, 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 was born at that moment. So this is a copy of the letter that uh, Dyson sent to his colleague Zellberg saying, hey, this is the reference that Dr. Montgomery could use, a book showing that the pair correlation function of zeros of zeta function is identical with that of the eigenvalues of a random complex Hermitian or unitary matrix of large order. This is uh, up to date. I mean, this connection has grown immensely. This, there is a source of, uh, of very, very interesting works in the interface of, of physics and number theory. So let me just mention one last application that we did in connection to this theory, which is the following. Uh, so 
Montgomery's work is, is based on, this, on, this, on the evaluation of this function. He calls, well, we call it now Montgomery's F alpha function. And you, so you can define this function, let's call it, you fix a, a, a big T, which is going to be the height. You call this function F of alpha T as just being 2 pi over t log t, so this is 1 over the number of zeros, morally speaking, and you're going to sum over pairs of ordinates, gamma and gamma prime, up to height t. You're going to sum t to the i alpha gamma minus gamma prime, multiply by this smoothing Poisson kernel, 4 over 4 plus gamma minus gamma prime square. Let this function, consider this function f alpha. What Montgomery really showed was that if alpha is between 0 and 1 in absolute value, he could really know, explicitly state what this function was. This function f of alpha t was actually given by this blah, this expression there. It has a delta spike at the origin, t to the minus 2 alpha log t, plus modulus of alpha times some error, plus some error term. And he conjectured that outside the interval minus 1, 1, outside the interval of absolute value 1, uh, this function f alpha should be morally just 1, just constant equal to 1. Okay? So this conjecture for his function f alpha was what made him conjecture the, 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 the pair correlation, what made him arrive at the pair correlation conjecture. So this conjecture for the function f alpha is sometimes is called the strong pair correlation conjecture. In fact, uh, this pair correlation conjecture, so if you believe that this function f alpha should be morally 1 uh, for alpha bigger than 1, this is equivalent to saying that, I mean, one can show that this is equivalent to showing this in average. So for any fixed beta and any length l, if you just integrate this function f alpha from b to b plus l, you should get l asymptotically, right? So if you can prove this for any interval, this is equivalent to proving what you want. And this is exactly what we have worked over the past months in improving to. So, for example, for this, for this integral version, or for this, for this average version, so the best result here was due to Goldstone and Gonek in the 90s. They proved that for, if you fix b and l, and l is large, if you integrate this function f alpha from b to b plus l, Remember, this should be equal to L, morally, right? They can prove that it's less than or equal than 2L and bigger than or equal than one-third of L. So on average, your function F alpha, which should be 1, you know, kind of loses to 2 and is bigger than one-third. The most recent result that we have been working on is to relate this problem to some other problems in Fourier optimization, and we are able to show the following bounds. This is a work with uh, Faishan D. Andres Chiri, who appeared in the previous picture, and Michael Milinovic. So we can show that for any fixed b and l large, the average of the function f alpha from, the inter from b to b plus l, so the integral from b to b plus l, is bigger or equal than 0.927 times l and loses to 1.33 times l. So we're, we're bringing up the factor of one third in the lower bound to almost 93% and we're bringing down the factor 2 in the upper bound to less than 4 thirds. So this says that f alpha in average is at least 0.92 and one, between 0.92 and 1.33. We don't know yet if we can still improve this a little bit better. All right. I guess I reached the end of my talk. I just wanted to... to mention to you a story that happened to me a few years ago, and then I will conclude. So this is on the same conference that I went in Canada in 2015, that I showed you the picture of what Jeff Baller and the tomb of Raymond Paley. I, I, received the, I received the best prize in mathematics of my life, you know? This, this, this ever occurred to you? I mean, this, this is something that occurred to me that I think is, is rather strange. I received a compliment, and the person that gave me the compliment doesn't know, doesn't even know that he did so. He said, this haven't happened to you? So the story is the following. I was at this conference in Banff, and uh, 
My advisor was there. My advisor is a, is a, is a, is a genius guy. He's a brilliant mathematician. Definitely one of my favorites. Uh, so we were seated at this conference. And uh, we, know we both admired the work of Montgomery a lot. A few months before the conference, maybe a year before the conference, you know, we are all mathematicians here. We receive a lot of papers to referee, right? You know, you know that papers, for those of you in the audience who are not you know, in the world of mathematics, so every time you submit a paper in mathematics, somebody else has to read your paper and give an evaluation. This is called the referee of the paper, right? And it's anonymous. You don't know who it is. You just get a referee report saying, yes, this paper is very good. I recommend it to the journal. Or sometimes you get a negative response, and you get some feedback from the referee and so on. And if it doesn't work, you submit to another journal. A year or two years before this conference, I had received a paper to referee. It was a paper from my advisor, uh, submitted to a prestigious journal. You know, we are all busy. We receive lots of papers to referee all the time. Sometimes we can give more attention to a paper. Sometimes we just give a quick opinion, say yes. But when I received this paper, I say, well, it's not often that you have really the chance to sit down and read a paper and while you referee, you actually learn from the paper. So I took that opportunity to sit down and study the paper. So it, it took me a few weeks to read the whole thing. So I read, but very careful, very carefully. I spotted out some, some things that needed some improvements. I outlined what the improvements should make and so on. So I wrote a very detailed referee report for this paper from my advisor. It was a beautiful paper. Of course, I recommend it to the journal with high, you know, priority and so on, but I wrote a six or seven page referee report. Of course, I knew about the paper. He had sent it to me before, the, when, before submitting to a journal. He had sent by email to me, yeah, I found this paper, you might find it interesting and so on. Anyway, he doesn't know I was the referee of this paper. He might just be learning this now if he's watching this talk. I never told this story to him. We met at this conference uh, one year later and uh, on the first day of the conference, I sat beside him, and I asked him, you know, Jeff, how, how did things end up with that paper of yours from last year? You know, very nice paper. What happened? And he was very happy. Oh, you know, it was accepted in the journal. You know, I was very happy. He was telling me the story. He's an older guy. So I was very happy. You know, I received a very nice referee report, you know, very detailed with lots of nice insights, you know. Referee was correcting some imperfections there, gave, giving us good feedback and so on. And I looked at him and said, good, good for you, man. That's very good. And then he just looked away from me, looked at the board, and he said, like, very innocently, you know, Emmanuel, I am very, I'm almost sure that it was Montgomery who refereed my paper. <laughs> and I said, wow, so cool, man. This was kind of my best prize in mathematics that I ever received, the best compliment. And the person that did it doesn't even know that he gave me a compliment. <laughs> Jeff, this is for you if you're listening to this talk. Highly <laughs> appreciated. Same way I appreciate you, man. Thank you, everyone. Good vibes for you. Thank you very much for your attention. It was a pleasure to be with you here today. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Emmanuel, for this lovely talk. It was very nice. So, well, now, um, if time to questions. So, if someone have a question or comment, can write in the section of questions and answers, or just raise your hand in the Zoom, and I will allow you to talk. Now I can see the screen here, right? Participants, Q&A, yes. Uh, yes, you can. All right, I'm glad it will be recorded. Well, so, well, I, I have a, a little question. Um, maybe you already answered during the talk, but when you talk about this problem of prime gaps, that you explain the number theory problem and then uh, the Analytic, analytic approach, looking for the uh, maximize this quantity for a function f, just how is, if you have a lower 
or upper bound for this uh, analytic formula, how you can improve or get a result for the number theory problem? Just how is related? Yes, no, no, but this is absolutely a, a, a good question. This is absolutely a non-trivial part, you know. So the most beautiful part in these problems that I find is to actually establish the connection. So you have to establish a bridge that says, whenever I have this result in analysis, I can have this result in number theory. This is a difficult part. This is the difficult theoretical part. So for this prime gaps problem, it's, uh, there's a little bit of a long way to get there. It's not trivial. I mean, it's not something that I can explain to you here in a few minutes. Uh, but you're right. I mean, this is, this is one of the difficult parts of the business of this particular thing is to establish this bridge. I mean, there is the establish the, the theoretical bridge, and once you get to the problem, uh, to this optimization problem, you can start to investigate this optimization problem. You know, sometimes you can solve it explicitly, most of the times you cannot. And then you have to rely on maybe computational tools to estimate your answer or to provide good test functions and so on. But this enters also if you have the power to a more numerical world, to a more computational world, which is becoming more and more important nowadays, the, the ability to do, to use the, you know, to do computational mathematics. In this particular problem, Andre, I mean, this, this was a, a large, there was the use of the explicit formula, you know. The, the main idea is that if you have, you want to estimate the prime gaps, right? So if you have, if you have a, 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 an interval, if you have an interval which, which doesn't have a prime, if you have a big interval that does not have a prime in its interval, what you can do is you go to that explicit formula cooked up in some specific way, and you build a, you put a test function, you put a test function H, such that the Fourier transform, remember that in the explicit formula, the last sum appearing there was a sum over gamma, of, over lambdas of n. So this lambda is the function that has information on the primes, times h hat, times the Fourier transform of h. So you, you plug in a test function h that has support exactly in this big interval where you don't have primes. So if your function h hat is supported in this interval where you don't have primes, the last sum in the explicit formula is going to be very small because H hat is going to be supported in something that does not have primes, so, but then the, the, the big lambdas of n will be zero in this interval, morally speaking. So the sum will morally be zero, that final part of the explicit form. So this is how you have to explore. So you have to construct a, a nice test function, put in the support where in the interval that does not have primes. So this was our initial approach, but the band-limited function. Now, later we realized that we could actually not put a function that is entirely supported in that interval. We could just put any function that we wanted. We could evaluate the, the, the contribution of the, the function inside the interval, and we could estimate the contribution outside the interval, the bad contribution. So this is why you see in the Fourier optimization problem, you see a value f of 0, and you see a penalty, minus a times the integral of the bad part. So this is kind of estimating the bad contribution that the test function gives you. And this is how the free optimization problem is born. Okay, okay thank Good you question. for your answer. It's, it's very interesting, this, this way to connect two different areas to solve a problem. And there is a question in the, the list. Uh, Domenico says, is, is there a result for prime gaps that, that doesn't not assume Riemann hypothesis? Yes. So there is... Uh, so all that I told you is, is assuming the Riemann hypothesis, this is uh, the best known. If you don't assume the Riemann hypothesis, uh, there, are, there is a bunch of results. I mean, there is a series of results that come if you don't assume the Riemann hypothesis. The best, to my knowledge, I think it's Goldstone, uh, Eudrin, and Pintz. But you don't really have the same order of magnitude, square root p, log p. You really have p raised to some exponent here, which is strictly bigger than a half. So a half plus something. Okay, so it's a, it's a different problem. It uses different techniques. Okay, 
you should you can take a look at these results too. Prime gaps, this loop. And of course, this is kind of a dual problem of this uh, small gaps between primes. You know, you, you want to know how often in the sequence of primes you have small gaps. And in, among these problems, perhaps the most celebrated one is this twin prime conjecture. Do we have infinitely many primes, infinitely many primes, such that gap is just two? You know? This is a problem that goes in the, in the dual direction, in the different direction. I want to know, to estimate the, the big gaps. How big can the gap between consecutive primes be? Good. Okay, there is uh, another a comment in the chat. It says, um, hi, Professor, uh, from Junaid. Hi, Professor, in the beginning, you showed a slide about uh, your favorite paper, Riemann hypothesis through up to some factor. Can you please just show that slice again? <laughs> it's one of my favorite papers, yes, this, this paper that uh, share screen, let's see. Junaid, it was right here. I like the title of the paper. More than two-fifths of the zeros of the Riemanns at the function are on the critical line. Sometimes we joke with, uh, with uh, Brian, who wrote this paper. He proved that 40% of the zeros are on the critical line, that he, sh he should be entitled to 40% of the prize if he ever called the Clay Mathematics Institute to give his bank account to collect the $400,000. That would be good, no? It doesn't hurt. Here it is, Junaid. Hope you liked it, man. Well, any question or, or questions comment? or comments? If anyone wants to talk, we can allow to do it. Well, hopefully the students enjoyed. I know some of these might have been a bit harder, but it's just for you to give a, to get a glimpse of what's going to come after. But uh, if you have any questions, I'm always available to chat. Okay. Well, just people say it was ama an amazing talk, and I agree with that. So if there is no more questions or comment, uh, we can thanks again to Emmanuel for this lovely talk today. Thank, Thank you. you.